alien abduction theory. There can only be one truth, and those reactions are not it. So let me go ahead and tell you what the truth is. Have you ever heard the term rapture? Well, that's what has happened. Rapture means snatched away. The rapture is a term Christians have used to describe God's taking of his believers off the earth and into heaven. And you be, may be asking yourself, wasn't Jesus supposed to come back when this happened? Well, he did, sort of. But he never really came all the way to earth. He met us in the air as we were being raptured out of this world to be with him for all of eternity. The second coming of Jesus Christ will happen, but not for at least another seven years. The rapture, the disappearance of millions, was a prelude to that. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 to 52, the Apostle Paul states that we Christians will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Those who were alive and generally those who were alive and genuinely believed that Jesus Christ were the ones who disappeared. They didn't die, but they were changed. Their physical bodies are no longer here on this earth. They are in heaven. Furthermore, those who believe that Jesus, who believed in, in Jesus since the founding of the church nearly 2,000 years ago, but died, were also taken. Before I continue, it's important that you know more about Jesus. He is the most important part about this. I'm sure you've heard of him, but maybe have no clue of who he really is. Well, to understand the rest of this letter, it's imperative that you understand who he is. So I recommend you open your Bible that was with this letter, and I will reference the Bible for the duration of this letter. You will find it helpful. <clears throat> Quite simply, Jesus is the Son of God in the form of man. About 2,000 years ago, God sent him to the earth to die for the sins of every person. He took the punishment that we deserved. He is the Messiah that the many Jews are still looking for today. Unfortunately, they rejected him when he came 2,000 years ago. Every person left on this earth after the rapture also rejected him. That's why you were left behind. The good news is that you, have, you all have a second chance. There are over 400 prophecies concerning the Messiah in the Old Testament. These books were all written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. In the New Testament, in Matthew 1, it goes through a genealogy of Jesus. In fact, the very first verse of Matthew calls Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Genesis is the first book of the Bible written well over a thousand years ago, a thousand years before the birth of Christ. However, in that book, God says that through Abraham, all families on earth will be blessed, a reference to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus coming from a lineage of David, the king of Israel, is foretold in Psalm 132, verse 11, as well as Isaiah 11:10, Jeremiah 23, 5, and Jeremiah 33, 15, all Old Testament references. There are also prophecies, Numbers 24 and 17, that the Messiah would be a descendant of Jacob. All these prophecies were fulfilled by Jesus, all written hundreds of years before his birth. Need more proof that Jesus is the Messiah? Isaiah 7.14 in the Old Testament tells us that the Messiah will be born of a virgin. Matthew 8, 1, 18 to 25 in the New Testament details how Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. It's prophesied in Micah 5.2 that the Messiah would be born in the city of Bethlehem, Matthew 2.1 says that, Matthew 2, 1 says that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. <clears throat> uh, chapters 52 and 53 of Isaiah contain prophecies concerning the crucifixion of Jesus. Each of the four, first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, also called the Gospels, contain details concerning Jesus' crucifixion. I suggest reading the 19th chapter of John also. Also, if you read about his resurrection on the third day, also read about his resurrection on the third day, also prophesied in the Old Testament. But you need to know why Jesus was crucified. It was prophesied for centuries before it happened. Why did it happen? Why did it have to happen? Before you know that, you need to realize something. 
even though you were left behind, God loves you. And he loves you as much as he loves those he, you, he took to heaven. In fact, one of the most famous verses in the Bible speaks of God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16. God loves the world, everybody, so God loves you. But that still doesn't really answer the question of why you were left behind. Why weren't you raptured? Well, quite simply, God sent Jesus to die for your sins, but you didn't believe in him and trust him in, trust in him as your Lord and Savior. Let me tell you why you needed to do that. Number one, because you're a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have fallen short, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I have sinned, you've sinned, everyone has sinned except for Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He was, is, and always will be God. You aren't God, so we fall short of him. Because you're a sinner, number two, you deserve to die, Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because we have all sinned, we all deserve to die, but God sent Jesus as a free gift. He took our place on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He, meaning God, made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. Because Jesus was sinless, perfect, he didn't deserve to die. However, we did. But he died for us, so we don't have to. God can't permit sin into heaven. So for us to be able to spend eternity with God in heaven, a way needed to be provided so that we might be made righteous. The second part of this verse says that so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Since Jesus took the place of our sin, we are made righteous. Therefore, we can be with God. That is the free gift of eternal life. So why the gift? Number three, God loves you. But God demonstrated his own love towards us that in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. We didn't deserve it, but God loves us so much that even though we are sinners, even though we live 2,000 years after Christ died, he still died for us. No matter who you are and no matter what you've done, God loves you. That's ultimate, unconditional love. <clears throat> Number four, confess and believe. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10.13 says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You've got to believe that Jesus is Lord and that God sent him to die in your place. You have to earnestly receive him as Lord and Savior and confess it with your mouth. You can't be ashamed of it. Part of really believing is making it known and telling others. Number five, remember Jesus is the only way. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. No matter what anyone else might tell you, the word of God is clear. There is no other way to heaven, no other way to experience eternal life with God. Jesus is the answer and the only answer. You may be thinking, how can God, how can a God that loves so much leave people behind? Well, God is not only kind and loving, but he is also holy and just. He is the one true God, and he will not tolerate sin. He will not put up with people worshiping anything but him. He loves you, but you have to make the choice to love him and serve him. If you want to become a Christian, I'm going to give you the chance right now. Maybe you don't even need to read the rest. Maybe you're already convinced that Jesus is for real. Perhaps you new people who were Christians who are now gone. Well, if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can do it right now. Pray this prayer, or one like it, with all of your heart. Lord, I'm a sinner, and I confess to you that I am not worthy of the gift you've given me. I repent of my sins, and I believe that you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. And I believe that by the shedding of his blood, my sins are forgiven. I also believe that you, are, you have the power over death. 
I believe that you can give me eternal life because I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. I commit my life to you and I thank you for saving me. Not of my own works, but by the grace of God. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. If you said this to God and you meant it, you are a Christian and I congratulate you and I'm excited for you. I praise the Lord for your decision. The Bible says that angels will rejoice when someone invites Jesus Christ into their life. So rest assured that if you did accept the Lord, there's a party going on in heaven. If you didn't, I pray that you will make this decision for Christ. Rest assured everyone will make a decision about Christ to either accept him or reject him. But I will pray you make the right one. The rest of this will not be easy to read, whether you are a Christian or not. However, rest assured that if you are a Christian, this period of time will have a happy ending. The sad thing is, if, if you were left behind, chances are you will not survive the next seven years or so. They will be by far the worst years in the history of the planet. <clears throat> you may think, well, it certainly sounds like God is out to get me. That's not the case at all. Second Peter 3.9 says that God is not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. To repent means to turn away. In this case, turn away from sin. This is your chance to do just that. The remainder of your time on earth as we know it will not be easy. This is God's way of getting his message across to those who didn't believe in him before the rapture. It is also for the nation of Israel to come to the repentance and believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is their Messiah. God is going to pull out all the stops in an effort to get people to recognize that he is the one true God. Let's review what the rapture is. Rapture is a Latin word which means snatched away or caught up. And it's the term Christians use to describe the event that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15. We Christians will not all sleep, but we will be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. 1 Corinthians 4.16-17 to 17 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up, or raptured together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. <clears throat> Jesus himself says in John 14, 1 to 3, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If that were not so, I w would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. I love how Titus 2, verses 11 to 14 puts it. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of, our, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good. Jesus took every believer from the past who have died and us who are still alive and gave us new glorified bodies, then took us to heaven to be with him. The answer to where everyone has gone is the rapture. Just remember that you have a second chance to become right with God and live forever in eternity with him. But only if you accept his free gift of salvation. So what happens next? To put it bluntly, you're going to experience seven of the worst years in the history of mankind. Jesus said in Mark 13, verse 19, that these days of distress will be unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Many extraordinary things are going to happen soon, or are perhaps already happening. Before we really get into that, let's go over some of the signs that Jesus himself said about the end times. Turn your Bible to Matthew 24. In verse 4, Jesus says, Watch out that no one deceives you. I believe that even right now as I'm writing this, these words ring truer than ever. There are deceivers running, running rampant in the world we live in. 
Many of them hide under the banner of Christianity. The only way to know truth is to compare it to God's word as written in his holy Bible. Jesus goes on to say that during these end times, many will come in his name claiming to be Christ and will mislead many. Let me just say that when Jesus comes back, it'll be unmistakable. Starting in verse 6, Jesus says that you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are just the beginning of birth pains. First, let me talk about birth pains. Some start so mildly, you might barely notice them but they will increase in severity as time progresses. The contractions also get closer and closer together as a woman gets closer to birth. The same is true with these signs that Jesus is telling us about. They will get stronger and closer together as we get closer to the end. There have always been wars on earth. In the past, they've usually been between small tribes or countries on a localized level or an empire like Rome conquering multiple countries. But for the first time in human history, the 20th century brought something we had never seen before. 88% of the world's countries became involved in World War I. It was so unique that they called it the war to end all wars. But they were wrong, because not long after that came World War II, which was larger and worse than the earlier war, involving 95% of the world's nations. Also, these wars, in what set, these wars is what set the world down a path of globalism, which is something I'll get into later. As I write this, I'm hearing of rumors of, war, of World War III with the Ukraine and Russian conflict. Famines. Famines have also been common in the world throughout history, but like birth pains, as we get closer to the end, they will increase. Usually I hear of famines in a third world country, but recently I've been hearing about a coming food shortage in the United States even, and that's unheard of. Even now we are paying more and getting less amounts of food. Earthquakes. On the USGS website, you can search earthquake data. There's been an increase of earthquakes worldwide in recent decades, but more than that, the high-intensity earthquakes have increased 43% over the past two decades. <clears throat> These will continue to get closer together and more intense as we get closer to the end. It will culminate in a seven-year tribulation period with the mother of all earthquakes. I've had a huge interest and have studied the end times or eschatology since becoming a Christian in 2013. Keep in mind that this is my understanding of the tri how the tribulation will proceed. But with that, with that said, many other pastors and theologians hold the same views. If you're a Christian, you can ask God to give you wisdom and knowledge, and he will tell you what things you need to know. Let him guide you through these next seven years. Now on to what will happen from the beginning of the tribulation until Jesus returns. Depending on when you find this letter, certain things may have already happened or are beginning to take place. The entire world is about to be united under a one-world government and a one-world religion. There will be ten rulers that will come on the scene. Revelation 17, verses 12 and 13. It says, The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. The beast is a man that you need to know about and be on the lookout for. He will be a dynamic new leader who the world will look at as perfect, the, a man to solve the world's problems. The Bible calls this man Antichrist, and many scholars believe that he will come out of Europe. Daniel 9.26 says that the Antichrist will come from a people who destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman Empire. Antichrist will rise to power quickly, so fast you may not have even heard of him before it happens. He will be immensely popular. He and his new one world government will confirm some sort of seven year pact or treaty with the nation of Israel. The only real specific concerning 
the details of this agreement is that Israel is promised peace. Daniel 9.27 says that he will confirm a covenant with the many for one seven, meaning seven years. This pact is what will start the tribulation period. The signing of the seven-year agreement will signify the beginning of this period. I've also, I've talked about calling the tribulation. <clears throat> These will be the most horrific years in the history of the planet. Three-fourths of the population that did not disappear will die before the end of the tribulation. Think about that. 75% or three out of four people will be gone. This period will not be easy, but since you did not receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior before the rapture, you have to go through this. You may not live through it. In fact, if you're a Christian now, the chances of you living through it are even slimmer. But no matter how bad it is, as if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, eternal life is waiting for you, and it will be the greatest thing you've ever experienced. The tribulation is divided into three separate sets of seven judgments. All of these judgments are God's wrath being poured out on an unbelieving world. First are the seal judgments, then the trumpet judgments, and then the bull or vile judgments. These judgments are get progressively worse over the course of seven years, just like birth pains. <clears throat> uh, the seal judgments. The first seal is the white horse, Revelation 6, 1-2. This is the Antichrist. He comes with a bow, but no arrows, and wears a crown. I think this signifies that the Antichrist will be the king of the world, the leader of the one world government. He, he's coming with a bow, but no arrows, signifies that he will not use military force to attain his position. It will be slick diplomacy. I think the world will be in such turmoil that people will be begging for somebody to fix it, and the Antichrist is the man. You may already witness the coming of his coming to power. Second seal is the red horse, Revelation 6, 3 to 4. There will be peace at the beginning of the tribulation. The Antichrist will gain the support of a large majority through the seemingly miraculous diplomacy. There will be worldwide peace, but it will not last. There will be an uprising against Antichrist, creating a world war. Many will die. With today's weaponry, there's no, there is reason to believe that mass destruction and bloodshed could occur in very short time. Third seal is the black horse, Revelation 6, 5, and 6. After a war like what had just taken place, famine will occur and inflation will rise. This passage, suggest, passage suggests that it will cost a full day's wages for two pounds of wheat. For my research, two pounds of wheat is enough for one loaf of bread, and it will cost a whole day's wages. Verse 6 also says not to damage the oil and the wine. Many scholars believe since oil and wine are a luxury, that this prophecy is saying that the ruling elite of the world will not suffer like everyone else. The pale ashen horse, seal 4, Revelation 6, 7-8. <clears throat> The conditions resulting from the first three seals will lead to death on a massive scale, as war, famine, plague, and animal attacks cause one quarter of the world's population to die. The current population of the world is around 7.8 billion. We don't know how many people will be raptured, but one fourth of the remaining people will die over the course of the first four seal judgments. A quarter. Seal five is martyrdom of the tribulation saints. Christianity, after the rapture, will be starting from scratch. But there will be people who are saved during the tribulation. Hopefully you are one of them. The Bible calls those who receive Jesus after, as their Lord and Savior after the rapture are tribula tribulation saints. When this seal is broken, many of the believers are killed for their belief. If you have received Christ after the rapture, the hard truth is that you may be killed for your belief in Jesus. Pray to the Lord to give you courage and comfort. Your reward will be great. The wrath of the Lamb, seal 6, Revelation 6, 12 to, 13, 12 to 17. In this seal, God pours out his wrath with a great earthquake. I believe that this earthquake will set off all sorts of volcanoes, which would explain the sky turning black, 
and the moon looking like blood. At the same time, it seems that a massive meteor event will occur. Some experts have pointed out that the sky being rolled up like a scroll and the mountains and the islands being moved from where they sit could indicate a partial or full crustal shift of the Earth's surface. The ungodly will fear this judgment so much that they will hide in caves and mountains and beg for the mountains to fall on them. But amazingly, they still refuse to acknowledge and turn to God. By the time of... By the time of the earthquake, there will be many Jews coming to believe in Jesus. Revelation 7.4 talks about the 144,000 Jewish witnesses, 12,000 from each of the tribes. These witnesses will be protected supernaturally from the judgments to come. They are commissioned to preach the true message of Christ during the tribulation. <clears throat> Number 7, Revelation 8, one to 2 the breaking of the seventh seal unleashes the seven trumpet judgments. These judgments are so severe that the Bible says, when Jesus opens the seventh seal, there will be silence in heaven for about a half hour. Heaven is normally portrayed as a place of great joy. All of music, singing, shouts of praise will stop. Imagine how bad it will be if heaven goes silent. Now onto the seven trumpet judgments. The first one is the storm, hail, and fire, and blood. Revelation 8, 7. One third of the earth's trees and all the grass will be scorched when hail, fire, and blood rain down from the sky. The ecological ramifications will be devastating. This judgment was prophesied back in Joel 2, 30. The second one is the mountain of fire, Revelation 8, 8 to 9. Following the disaster from the first trumpet, there will be a great mountain burning with fire. This perhaps will be a giant meteor. It will land on the ocean and turn a third of the water to blood. A third of all the creatures on the sea will die, and a third of all the ships will sink. The judgment is being limited to a third of the world because the purpose of it is to turn people back to God, or to turn people to God. Number three, wormwood. Revelation 8, 10 to 11. Many men will die when another meteor type object or possibly a nuclear weapon falls on a third of the rivers of the earth. The water will become bitter and poisonous. Trumpet 4. One third of the sun, moon, and stars will be struck. Revelation 8, 12. This could be a result of the first three trumpets blotting out a third of the sun, moon, and stars. Or it could be God doing a supernatural dimming of it. Either way, the landscape and atmosphere will take on an increasingly apocalyptic appearance. Before the last three trumpets are blown, there is an ominous warning in the book of Revelation. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth, because the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels are about to sound. Revelation 8.13 The fifth trumpet, Apollyon... The Destroyer. Revelation 9, 1 to 11. This passage of Scripture talks about an angel unlocking a shaft to the abyss. From the abyss, smoke, smoke will fill the air along with a locust type creature, along with locust type creatures that will torment those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads for five months. Those who are tormented will want to die, but according to Scripture, death will flee from them. It's hard to imagine the kind of carnage that will result from this. People will want to die. They'll try to kill themselves. However, they won't be able to. The Bible says that these locusts had a king over them, an evil angel from the abyss. In Hebrew, the name of the angel is Abaddon. In Greek, the name is Apollyon. The name means destroyer. Trumpet 6 is the 200 million horsemen. Revelation 9, 13 to 19. The second of these three woes is unleashed. There will be an army of 200 million horsemen who will kill a third of mankind, all those, those who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. There are two schools of, thoughts about, of thought about this army. They are that it is the same human army as mentioned in Revelation 16.12, which... And also, number two, which I lean towards, is that they're in a demonic army. They will be frightening to even look at. 
Out of their mouths come smoke and sulfur, and the power of their horses is in their mouths and their tails, having heads that can inflict injury. Sounds demonic. Uh, the seventh trumpet ushers in the great tribulation. Just as the seventh, seventh seal judgment ushered in the trumpet judgments, the seventh trumpet judgment ushers in the bull judgments. While the seal and trumpet judgments will all take place during the first three and a half years of the tribulation, these final seven will occur at the last three and a half. It's called the great tribulation. <clears throat> I'll get into the bull judgments in a minute. But I think it's important to talk about the difference between the first half and of the tribulation and the second half, which is called the Great Tribulation. I'll also go over some events that take place at the midpoint of the seven years. You also need to know about two men. Since you are one of those left behind after the rapture, you may have already heard of them on the news. The two witnesses. Revelation 11, verses 3 to 6 it says, and I will grant authority to my witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows from their mouth and devours their enemies. So if, you, so if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain does not fall during the days of their prophesying and have the power to turn waters into blood and strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. These two witnesses are two men who will provide hope to those who receive Christ after the rapture. They will be a thorn in the Antichrist side, so to speak, because they will be invincible for the first half, three and a half years. They will proclaim the name of Jesus and many will come to believe through them. People who come against them will die by fire, which comes out of their mouths. So who are these men? Many believers say that uh, they're either two of the following. Elijah, Enoch, or Moses, and Moses. Enoch was a godly man who never died, Genesis 5.24. Elijah was a great Hebrew prophet who also never died, 2 Kings 2.11. Moses is the the only one of the three that did die, but kind of under mysterious circumstances, God himself buried him, and at some point Satan tried to steal his body. For whatever reason, Scripture doesn't really say. I'm one of the people that leads towards the belief that the two witnesses are Elijah and Moses, arguably the two most influential men of the Old Testament, Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. They were also the two men who were with Jesus and his three disciples when he was transfigured in Matthew 17. Also, Moses and Elijah are men who already performed the miracles that these two men will do. When their three and a half years of invincibility are complete, at the midpoint of the tribulation, they will be murdered by the Antichrist, and the unbelievers of the world will love it. They will not be buried. Instead, their bodies will be left to rot. People will be happy that people will be so happy that they'll exchange gifts. However, the celebration will turn sour three and a half days later because it says that God will raise these two men from the dead and then bring them to heaven. At that time in Jerusalem, there'll be an earthquake and 7,000 people will die and a tenth of the city will collapse. The survivors will be terrified and give glory to God. <clears throat> Uh, the fatal head wound of the Antichrist. In Revelation 13.3, the Antichrist will receive some sort of fatal or seemingly so wound, and it will be miraculously healed. This counterfeit resurrection will mimic that, of, mimic that of Christ, and many will be deceived and will worship Satan and the Antichrist because of it. Furthermore, the Bible says that the Jewish temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt most likely as a part of the seven-year peace treaty at the beginning of the tribulation. And that Satan, possessing the Antichrist, will declare himself to be God in the temple. Daniel 9.27 calls this the abomination of desolation. 
Since Satan will then possess the Antichrist, the next three and a half years is called the Great Tribulation. They will be even worse than the first half. Another character is the false prophet. In Revelation 13, we see a beast rising from the earth. This is the false prophet, and he, even though he is depicted as a lamb, this beast will speak like a dragon. He will be a religious leader who unifies the world into worshiping the beast. He will have satanically empowered abil abilities that will deceive many together with Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet. They form an unholy trinity of sorts. A twisted counterfeit of the real trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Mark of the Beast, Revelation 13, 14 to 18. The false prophet will somehow bring an idol of the Antichrist to life. This image of the beast will have the ability to kill anyone who refuses to worship the idol. He will also institute a global cashless system that will require everyone on earth to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead in order to purchase anything or conduct businesses of, of any kind. There is technology out there today which could easily implement the system. It could be a microchip ingest, injected under the skin, a digital tattoo, or even some sort of DNA manipulation. It will somehow have some sort of technology linking it to the number of the beast's name, which is 666. I got this written in bold. If you worship the image or take the mark of the beast, you will send yourself to hell for all of eternity. And that's found in Revelation 14, 9 to 12. This will take an Im immense courage, but the Lord will be with you. The next verse says, Blessed are those in the Lord from now on. Yes, they will rest from their labors and their, for their deeds will, will follow them. The bold judgments in Revelation six, 16. The first one is painful sores. Revelation 16, one says that those who take the mark of the beast, worship the image of Antichrist, will develop painful boil-like sores. Again, this could be a supernatural type of sore it could also be a reaction to whatever technology is being used as the mark. Or it could be nuclear poisoning or some sort of DNA manipulation gone bad. This judgment will not affect the tribulation saints. The second one is the seas turn to blood. Revelation 16.3 Quite simply, the oceans and seas will turn to blood, and every living creature in them will die. Can you imagine the stench? I don't know if this will be literal blood or what is known today as red tide, where microorganisms multiply rapidly and turn water, turn seawater red and deplete it, depleted of oxygen. Either way, the fishing industry would be destroyed, dead animals would rise to the surface and become beached. Potential of disease will be huge. Uh, the rivers and springs become blood, Revelation 16.4. The rest of the world's water source will also be turned to blood, creating havoc. Can you imagine a world without a water supply? Well, it's going to happen. You have to think that by this point in time, there will be no doubt in anyone's mind that there is a God. The only question is, whom do you serve, God or Antichrist? The fourth bowl is scorching heat. <clears throat> Revelation 16.8 says that this... It says this time the the sun will be scorched. Yeah. This time the sun will scorch people with immense heat. This could be a massive breakdown of the Earth's atmosphere or massive solar flares. Whatever it is, people will still refuse to repent and glorify God. The fifth bull is the world goes dark. The kingdom of Antichrist will be plunged into darkness. I'm not sure if this will be the whole world or just the headquarters of the Antichrist, but I can only imagine the frustration that will envelop people that this will affect. But people will still curse God and refuse to repent. The sixth bold judgment is the Euphrates River dries up, Revelation 16, 12. The longest river in Western Asia, the Euphrates, will dry up making a way for the kings of the east which are the Asian nations, to advance in the direction of Israel to the Valley of Megiddo, also known as the Valley of Armageddon. 
This will be a staging area for the final end time event, final end time battle. The greatest earthquake, number seven. Revelation 16, 17 describes the seventh bold judgment. There will be an earthquake so great that the topography of the earth will be altered. Islands and mountains will be gone. Cities around the world will collapse. And the great city, most likely a reference to the Antichrist kingdom, will be split into three parts. If that weren't bad enough, 100-pound hailstones will fall on, on mankind. The glorious appearing and second coming of Jesus Christ. It's all been leading up to this. When the seven years are complete, Matthew 24, 29 tells us that the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give off its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So in a universe full of darkness, a window of heaven will open up, and out of it will come Jesus Christ. Followed by the angel armies of heaven and his church, those, who, those of us who were raptured. Every eye will see him. The Antichrist and his armies will try to make war with Christ, but it will be no fight at all. At that time, all those who failed to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior will be slain by the word of his mouth. The Antichrist and the false prophet will be thrown in the lake of fire, and Satan will be bound in the abyss for 1,000 years. The thousand-year reign of Christ, also known as the Millennial Kingdom, will be one of the most glorious eras in the history of the world. Here are some quick notes about the Millennial Kingdom. People's lifespans will be much longer, much like it was in the book of Genesis, Isaiah 65. Animals will no longer want to eat or attack you or each other, Isaiah 65, 6 to 9. Uh, the earth will be renovated, Isaiah 2, 2, also chapter 11 and Zechariah 14, 8. Jesus will rule the entire world with righteousness, Isaiah 9, 7. And Satan will be bound so that he will not be able to deceive anyone. After the thousand years, Satan will be released from the abyss for a short time. Then he will deceive many and try one last time to overthrow God. But fire will come down from heaven and devour them all. Satan will then be thrown into the lake of fire and everyone will be judged by whether they accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Those who have not will join Satan in the lake of fire. Those who have will be with the Lord for eternity. This is called the great white throne judgment. After this, God will create a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation 21 and 22. Again, I hope that you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. These next years will be harder than anything you have ever faced. I have a USB drive called a rapture kit along with this letter. In there, you will find many books, videos, and other resources, along with the Bible in multiple languages. You can plug it into a computer or a TV, that, and it's small enough to keep hidden from those who are pursuing you. Your job now as a believer is to try to bring others to saving faith in Jesus and find fellow believers so that you can strengthen and encourage one another. I will end this letter with Jesus' words in Revelation 22, verses 12 to 14. He says, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. Verse 17 says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him him take the free gift of the water of life. May God bless you. you guys all right? Are you all right? I'm all right. If you know Christ, you don't have to go through any of it. But with that said, that's why it's so important to tell people about him before this happens so they don't have to go through it. So, let's pray.
Father, we thank you for for giving us your word and these prophecies ahead of time. We know that the hour is short and that your coming could happen at any moment. And then these events that you've told us about ahead of time will take place. And We just ask you, while we're still here, to give us courage and boldness to tell people about your son Jesus, to get them saved so that they don't have to face it. And our hope, Lord, is that at the end of all this, it's going to be the greatest time in the history of the world where you are ruling and reigning with righteousness. There'll be nothing better than that. I pray that uh, the people here have a good week. Bless them and walk with them. Put people in their paths this week that need to hear from you and use us to do it. We thank you, we praise you, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.